Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered if we just think about time all wrong? That maybe the way we think of time and how we should manage it is putting everything in the wrong priority. That's what we'll talk about today. Don't spend time beating on a wall, hoping it'll transform into a door. Coco Chanel. Today we're going to talk about the book, 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals by Oliver Berkman. This book is an interesting book because sometimes I think we think of time all wrong. I know for myself, I'm very obsessed with time, about managing my time. I even redid my time blocking method after watching some podcasters talk about it. But yet, somehow, it's possible that we're all wrong about time, and it's all wrong about the priorities and the management of time. And that's what this book is talking about. The author himself, he thinks we have it all wrong. And while I disagree with some fundamental things about this book, he has some excellent points. And that's what we're going to talk about today. A while ago, I had a friend who worked in a museum, and she was showing us this watch that was from the owner of this house, and it didn't have a second hand on it. It's like, well, how do you have a watch without a second hand? And she says, well, that was a sign of wealth. Because if you're that wealthy, you don't have to have a second hand on your watch because you don't have to follow time that closely. It's only the people who work for a living on a regulated schedule who has to pay attention to it. And in thinking of that, that might have been true at the time. I don't think that's true right now. For example, if you have a very wealthy business person, like Jeff Bezos, has to have that second hand on the watch because his life is full of meetings. And if he didn't have a second hand on his watch, he wouldn't know when his meeting half past the hour was going to happen. So it's not a wealth thing anymore. And so this book says that the real problem with the way that we look at time is it puts all this pressure on us. It makes us feel worse about our lives, worse about everything that's going on for us. And it really doesn't have to be that way. Time could be something that we look at differently. He talks about in ancient times or even medieval times, you didn't really have to worry about time then either because you just worked all day long and you got up in the morning at sunrise and you worked and you went to bed at sunset. Time really didn't matter because you didn't have any free time. I was listening to this interview and it was talking about time traveling in the science fiction uh, way. And they asked a person, they said, well, if someone from our past, let's say the 1800s, came to our world today, what do you think that they would be most shocked about? You think it'd be cars? You, you think it would be airplanes? And he said, no, absolutely not. It would be the sheer volume of free time we have now. Our whole lives, up to very recently in the history of humanity, was all about hunting and gathering. Whether it was a job in the medieval times where you had to work for someone so that you could buy enough food or buy a cow to feed your family, or if it was even in earlier days when all your days were spent collecting, processing, and winterizing food just to survive. We don't live in that lifestyle anymore. And so just the fact that we talk about time shows you the luxury of our society because no one in the past would ever talk about time, which is why you have church bells that go off at the hour. It doesn't even matter what time it is. We just have to know the hour so that we know when we can go home or when we have to be there. He makes it sound grim, too. He talks about someone named Edward Hall who made the same point that says, basically, time is like a conveyor belt, like almost Lucy and the chocolate conveyor belt, where it's just flying off the end and we can't catch it long enough to make us feel like we are in control of time and we hope we make good use of our times. The author says that really there's too many activities there's too many busyness things that we're doing. There's too many things that we're trying to get done, and we don't have to look at it that way. In fact, we've put our whole time into containers. There's work time, 
there's after work time, there's weekend time. And basically, you're selling those containers of time so that you can have some free time without worrying about it. You work hard so you can have a vacation. You get enough money to feed your family so that you can go home at the end of the day and know that your family is being taken care of. But these containers are really what's keeping us from having the most fulfilling time. He talks about the fact that a lot of this has to do with the fact that in history, it was task orientation. I have to plow the field. I have to milk the cows. And it's not even that long ago. I remember even from high school time where the kids who belonged to farms would get extra time away from school because it was a certain farm time. It was the time to harvest. It was the time to plant. You know, whatever it is you had to do, that took more importance than anything because that was task living. And when an important task came up, that took all other things and put them on the back burner. He talks about that in history because they were task oriented. No one felt troubled because, again, they didn't have the means of measuring it. They didn't even look at time in that way. And so they didn't have this feeling of that conveyor belt. That this conveyor belt of time that we just feel it slipping away is a modern construct. Now we have all these things that we have to do that just eat up all of our time. And he said that, quote, the fundamental problem is is that attitude towards time sets up a rigged game in which it feels impossible to ever feel as if you're doing well enough. And so that's the problem he sees in all of this is that we always feel behind. We feel like our family wants our time, our work wants our time. Gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had some time? And then we get burned out. It destroys the quality of life we have. He said that even times in the past, he feels like he's a recovering alcoholic. He used to be that guy who broke his times into 15-minute increments, scheduled them all, and used a timer to make sure that he spent the exact amount of time he's had scheduled for a task on that task. It's called the Pomodoro Technique, and that technique has a huge following. A lot of people swear by it. And he said the more he got his time organized, the more stressed out, and the less he had ability to control his life. And that was a huge breaking point for him when he realized that even if he is very organized, goes down to the 15-minute block, he is still not good enough to make his time work. And he says what's even worse is that when we do schedule our times, to the extent he did that, you'll realize that the whole point of all of this is you don't have enough time and you will never have enough time. And you have to start making hard choices that are going to be terrible for you or terrible to your family or terrible to your job. And you'll just beat yourself up because you can't get there. And when he brings up all these symptoms of how time is destroying us, He just sees that all the self-help, all the things that adults do to sort of distract themselves between coloring books or anxiety baking, he calls it, it's showing us that we're just failing at getting our time together and it's making us miserable. And the best way we found out to break ourselves of the pressures and the stress and the depression over time is to do all these fiddly things, these tasks, these little games on our phone, these ways of just relieving the pressure inside our system. And that, again, wastes more time. So then we feel even more stressed about things and that we'll never feel like we're getting anything of our priorities done. So then we try to work faster. We try to cut a few corners. We try to do things. Oh, well, I never saw this shortcut before. I found this great way to do stuff in a new way. That will completely save time. My boss will never notice that I'm doing a terrible job on this project, but my kids will be happy because I'm at home more. And now you're pitting your job against your family and trying to find shortcuts. And it just gets even worse then. And unless we have some strict guidelines or some definitive goals, we'll just feel like we're just expanding and expanding and expanding. He agrees that some technology makes it easier for us to organize, makes it a little bit more helpful to get things done and get over some of these hurdles. But it also sometimes can enable us to do more things that we shouldn't be doing 
And it makes it so much easier to get us to do those things that we shouldn't be doing. And our life gets even worse. Now, he blames tech. And I think that tech is an agnostic tool. I think that it can be used to try to make us worse. It can be used to try to make us do things that we shouldn't be doing us, having task lists that remind us of the things we shouldn't be doing. But that's more about us. If we had solid task lists that are just filled with the things we should be doing, the to-do apps would actually be helping us. He suggests that what we even do in order to fight off these problems that we have with time, it's like juggling a bunch of balls. Well, maybe if I'm not doing a very good job of juggling three balls, I'll put a fourth ball in the air and then that'll make it better. Then what you end up doing is you get bored with just this ball or this task or this project and then you go off and do another one because that way you're keeping your sanity. You have that variety. But instead, what you're really doing is now not getting four tasks done instead of not getting three tasks done. And so in reality, it's even worse by us trying to get more variety. We just have to learn how to say no to those things that is cluttering our lives. We talked about in episode three about how to ruthlessly say no to things in some books and some advice from Warren Buffett about how we could do that. But essentially, we're not going to get anywhere until we start saying no to stuff. And he says, too, that if we're worried and we procrastinate and waste even more time not doing our tasks because we think we'll never be good enough and it'll never get done in a way that is flawless, it's time to give up that illusion that we can be flawless and start actually doing things that are realistic, good enough, or something that will solidly get the task done that we need to do. And since we can't get everything done, we don't want to get everything done or we wouldn't have any free time or time with our families or other things, it's time to start putting in limits. And even sometimes on things that we like, that are enjoyable and fun, and those are distractions that are distracting us from the very things that really do matter in our lives. The trap part is where he says, quote, The more firmly you believe that it ought to be possible to find time for everything, the less pressure you feel to ask whether a given activity is the best use for a portion of your time. So if you're terrible at time management, you start realizing I can't get everything done. But when you're good at it, that's when you even get even worse about those things. And if we think about all the resources we have available to us, you know, money and food and gas and things that we have that are resources that we spend. But one that matters the most is time because there are ways we can get more money and there are ways that we can get more food, but nothing will allow us to get more time. We feel as if it's free. I know I used to say something, well, I don't have money to donate to charities. I do have time, which is free. It's how we look at time. It's just free. But instead, it's actually the most important, most valuable thing that we have. And so when we burn time by either doing something we shouldn't be doing, or maybe even just blowing it by not just playing a video game to relax, but blowing an inordinate amount of time playing video games so that our life never makes progress, we're actually damaging the one thing we can't afford to damage. You can't get time back. He talks about Seneca, who was a Roman, and he wrote a book called On the Shortness of Life. And Seneca blasted people around him because they were wasting their times either on political careers or huge parties and not pursuing the very things that mattered the most in life. He accused them of sunbathing, and he thought that they were just going out and partying their life away. In a sense, we do the same kinds of things, too. We scroll one more time in one of our social media, or we play games on our phone that just waste hours of time. There's all sorts of things that we do in order to distract ourselves from the things that matter, too. In a sense, since the time of Seneca, we haven't really learned much about being focused on what's important. He says that we even try to do all these things 
to get away from those types of things that are distracting us. We put these blocking things on our phone. There's focus mode on Apple devices that will hide a lot of apps from you so you can't even see them. Noise canceling headphones. Maybe we'll put our phones or our computers in another room just to try to see if we can reclaim some of the time we're just losing. Heck, our phones will even tell us how much time we're spending doing all those things. And he says, too, that if we can't regain that attention, that focus on what's really important, we can go to the best restaurant in the world and we might as well just eat garbage because we're not focusing on this wonderful meal, the great friends we have around us, and everything that makes that meal fantastic. And he gives a quote from the poet Mary Oliver that says, Attention is the beginning of devotion. If we're not paying attention, we're not actually appreciating or loving the things and people around us that we should be paying attention to. And so not only are we all tied up in trying to manage our time, we're all tied up in trying to manage our attention. And even talks about how all these online social media are actually there to try to get us to break out of our time. They hire psychologists that know exactly how to destroy our attention. And it keeps trying to pester us into doing what they want us to do. And it's always the famous quote that when it comes to the social media, you're not the user, you're not the customer, you're the product. And if you don't come back to these social media groups and all these things that are taking away your attention, then these other companies will stop making money, even if joining those things costs us no money. It costs everything else. It costs our time. It costs our attention. And it makes us feel terrible with all the fake stuff out there, all the people yelling at each other on the social media. So it's even worse. We're taking the most valuable things in our lives and giving up the people who matter the projects that matter, and instead we get chaos, fighting, yelling, and everything that's wrong with the world instead of everything that's right with the world. He talks about Mary Oliver talking about that distraction is the intimate interrupter because we're doing it to ourselves. Inside, we're pounding on the walls, we're making noise, we're trying to hey, wouldn't you rather play a video game? Hey, wouldn't you rather go do this over here? Wouldn't you rather go to the bar tonight instead of doing this thing you want to do? And unfortunately, it means that the enemy's from within, that we're the ones that are taking our time and taking our attention and destroying it. And the worst thing is, is that the distractions we have for our attention isn't really the problem at all. The problem is, is that these distractions we're doing is because we're trying to escape this time lock that we put ourselves in, this conveyor belt of time management that we can't ever get ahead. And so when we feel terrible about it, we feel behind, we feel stressed, we escape through distractions to get away from feeling that way. And he says, quote, the most effective way to sap distraction of its power is just to stop expecting things to be otherwise. That we have to realize that sometimes things are going to feel unpleasant. Sometimes we're just not going to do the kind of job that we hope to do or that we have the kind of time we'd hoped we would have had. Once we acknowledge that we live in this imperfect situation, now we can go on with our lives. He says in the end that all of this makes us stressed because we worry about our relationships, our marriage, our children. We worry about whether or not we have enough money to do things. And this constant struggle we have over our attention, over our time, is really talking about our future and how we do these things because we want a better future. But in the end, because of these time sinks and these distraction things, we are getting farther and farther away from them. So this is the first episode. We kind of identified the problem. We're juggling too many balls, trying to be too perfect, and the fact that we cannot get everything done. So my challenge to you is write up a list of all the things in your personal life 
that you are expected to get done. Maybe it's painting something that you promised your wife you would do. Maybe it's setting up that thing you bought last year and you never quite got to it. Or maybe it's just getting around to some of the mundane tasks you have around your house that you're meaning to do. Write those all down, and the next week we'll talk about what you can do to start chopping that list into something that you can actually accomplish. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at smallstepspod.com or visit the website, smallstepspod.com, and that way you can see all the past episodes or find me on Twitter. And please remember that you can tell a friend about this podcast because they can start getting their life back by taking small steps.